Can you attention please? First of all, um, it's very pleasing to see that we're not only um, people by teachers here today, that there are a number of people who have an interest in the school or an interest in raising boys, which is uh, the topic and the focus of this, week, this weekend's uh, <coughs> development. Uh, some of you are here because some of you are here because uh, it's the Staff Development Weekend, but others are here because you want to be, which is great. And, uh, and obviously there are any, any one of these development type things, um, intended outcomes and of course some unintended outcomes. Now, some of the things we can control, and those, that is the program and what we put in place, uh, things we can't control are the people who we've asked to speak. And uh, I, mean, that's just <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. I've tried to control it as best I can. I hope it will go well. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you. <laughs> Almost there, felt like a boy at school before they speak from Sage. Show me your speech beforehand. <laughs> Maybe I should have sent it to you. Do you know the sense of, uh, uh, not quite fear, but for the, for the sense of uh, antipodal. Anticipation, maybe, that goes through when you get phoned by, by Sean and he says to you, um, will you speak on the, uh, the topic of some sort? And you immediately think, well, I'm meant to be a guru on this. Or I'm not a professional speaker, but I am a guy who's run a school for 15 years, uh, a boys' school for 15 years. And uh, I think in that time one does acquire a, <coughs> an ability to work with, to find out what works best for boys. And I'm going to pass that on to you today, what we found which works for us. It's certainly not meant to be in any way saying that you're not doing that. Uh, but I'd like to just go through with you what made us do our various changes, what got us thinking about boys, and uh, what we are trying to do in school. And you can take from there whatever you wish. I do want to point out that I've very carefully put my colors for this thing. I've got run and wash gold, and all the slides are a new background. I just thought I'd point it out to you before. <laughs> but um, they have taken some effort on this one. I'm in the way. I don't know where else to stand. Where you want to um, I thought what I'd do is I'd just start the slide just to show a little bit, uh, just show you about boys and how they think and how they act. And I'd ask you while you, uh, while you listen to this video, which is a New Zealand ad, just think to yourself, would this boy have been a prefix of the topic? And how do you handle him in class? It's a 45 second ad. One minute, one minute please. No, thank you. Could you all please put down your pens and bring your papers to the front of the room? Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, too late. Okay, plenty of points at that time. You failed. Sorry. Excuse me, do you know who I am? I have absolutely no idea. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that boy had been a prefect of Ronald. <laughs> I wonder how one would react to that. I showed that slide to new teachers, or that to new teachers a year or two back, and I discussed with them how they would handle the situation <coughs> in class. And in the end, I said, "There's only one action you can do with that, and that you've got to laugh." And and 95% of the time, if you can, if you're able to laugh at boys and their actions, you actually it's going to be fine. Because boys. Or innovative things, as the case may be. Right, there is my title for today, uh, Eric, encouraging the champion within and leading to uh, student leadership, pupil leadership, uh, and uh, how to draw boys out of that potential they got with the internet. So I thought I'd start with that painting, which is on the wall of my office. It was drawn two years ago by a trick boy, uh, and he entitled it, Who Am I? And I think we had to, and, and it, 
so what the picture is, is a uh, boy himself in the middle and then two images of himself, one whispering in one ear and one whispering in the other. And I can't tell you how often I've got boys in my office who uh, I refer this painting to and we sit and we discuss this painting. He entitled it, Who Am I? But I thought it was a really good topic, <coughs> a, a slight to solve my topic today, because within every one of us, and certainly within the, every adolescent boy, there are always two voices, and your success in life is which one you listen to. One on the left saying do it, the one on the other side saying don't do it. And we discuss this with boys, and I tell you, boys can see that, uh, and they can see the point of that painting entirely. And that is the best thing that I've got in my office, that one. <coughs> I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Kelly. We've got a counseling staff of three at Weinberg, and Catherine heads up the counseling department. And I've asked her along today uh, as a booster, because I'm naturally shy. And also that if she can and uh, just pipe in whenever she wants, because she and I work very closely together uh, on this aspect of boys. And so, if we start with the premise that every boy has got within side, not only a good side and an evil side and a bad side, but he's also got within him the ability to be good and and to I don't mean from a naughty point of view, but the ability to do and has talent, then we are on the right track with regard to boys. So that painting starts off the afternoon. I found this on a school website, not a Cape Town school, I might add. Uh, but when I saw it, I thought, well, it's, it's really opposite to everything that I think the direction that school should be going to now. Please note that I've changed the uh, picture at the top. That's a Gryffindor prefect bag. Uh, but being a prefect is a massive advantage for you in the future. Research shows that successful business people hold positions of responsibility while at school. Now, I think that all of us who have been teaching for more than two weeks know that school is no predictor of success. If we look back to our own careers uh, at school and see who's done well in theory, <coughs> it may not be the thing. And people who thought were very insignificant and innocuous in school uh, come through and are real successes in life. So the first part is just absolute nonsense. And I anyone can have that on a website. Uh, beats me. But the second part is interesting because it says research shows that successful business people hold positions of responsibility <coughs> while at school. <coughs> Clearly, they mean creeping. But uh, I think that the more that we can get our boys to take on positions of responsibility, the better. I was asked, I wrote, I wrote down when Tracy first rang me, she said to me, and I've just written it down. She said, please make sure that the word leadership is not only about being captain and a bomber, headmaster, or whatever. And I think that must just be a, an absolute understood that when we talk about leadership now in schools, we're not only talking about prefecture. Prefecture is just a very small smattering of our trip class. Right, so we need Gryffindor. We do go back to it after a while. Peter Sanger was very much the in uh, guru. 20 years ago for, with regard to leadership. And this is as good a quote on leadership as you will see. He wrote this book, uh, they call The Fifth Discipline for Managers in Business. And he then wrote another one, which I've just put the cover on there, Schools That Burn, using the same principles that he had. But this one that he said here, we tend to think of leadership as a quality which exists in certain people. How often do we say, we do it all the time at our place, that's a good boy, great actor, he's going to be a head boy, yes. We do it all the time. So how often do we think of leadership as a quality which exists in certain people? This way of thinking has many traps. We search for special individuals while leadership potential, with leadership potential, rather than developing the leadership potential in every people. And shortly after this, this chap Greenleaf came out with these books on servant leadership, and schools started doing all sorts of interesting things uh, uh, in the uh, 1998, 1999. For example, Hilton and Dunaway all prefixed completely. They were the first schools to do it. Bishops have followed suit. Uh, now, each school must do what's best for itself. I personally still believe in prefix. I think they have a role to play, uh, depending what responsibilities you give them. But uh, and to throw everything up to me doesn't, uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's the right way to go. But a lot of people repeat us saying, seriously, and Greenleaf's servant leadership uh, is something that we will dwell on quite a bit this afternoon. Right, so today's seminar of boys helping other boys up the mountain. I'm just going to give you the headings of what I'm doing today. 
First of all, we're going to discuss things about the adolescent brain, which we have to understand because they're not easy to make certain decisions. Adolescent male brain, and these are ladies here making funny comments. Uh, the same one is the game is changing, the whole game of prefix and student leadership and leadership in society, and society itself is changing. Uh, I'm going to dwell on the fact that leadership equals learning, or learning equals leadership, whatever way you want to go. If they're not learning, then they're not leading. And then I'm just going to say some tips, which you can take or reject that's just a bit. So that's where I'm going today, four headings. Right, the first one. Now, I'm acutely aware that tomorrow morning you've got Gavin Keller here. Uh, Gavin Keller is a speaker of some repute. Uh, he's an expert on this uh, adolescent brain. Uh, he got me thinking of it, but I'm nowhere near as an expert as he is. But I've just taken some aspects which I understand. I'm just going to pass it on to you uh, as I understand this and what it's meant when it comes to promoting the potential of boys. If you take it as the brain is roughly in two parts, you've got a cognitive part, and uh, that's the right hand side of the brain, moving from the back. Uh, that's, you see the more working way diligently there. And, and on the other side, the left hand side of the brain, uh, is the one that's the artistic side, the creative side, the loving side, the romantic side, everything's in the right hand side of the brain. Now the trick is, uh, to get the two sides of the brain to work together. Now, between those two brains, sides of the brain, oh no, let me do that. Uh, you have got going between the two sides, I'm going to do it with my hands. But if you take that as the two sides of the brain, between the two, you've got millions of telephone wires communicating one side to the other. Now, those telephone wires in girls start developing at about eight or nine. And uh, with boys, they start developing at about 12, where the two start talking to one another. And for boys, they carry on. It carries on growing until about the age of 21, 22. So the male brain is actually not developed until the early 20s, which might get some of you mothers nodding your heads and not understanding husbands. The, uh, the, the question for us is, what, what is that relevant to those of us in boys' school? Because our job, here's a key thing, our job is to be developing those telephone wires. Other boys are going to do terribly, are going to be doing stupid things. It's no coincidence that they don't, uh, that they load the insurance premiums on young drivers. Because the two sides of the brain aren't connected yet. No coincidence that many states in America don't allow uh, young people to drive till they're 21. Because if your two sides of the brain are not connected, you're going to be uh, pushing that accelerator down with the orange light and just going through without thinking. Because if the two sides of the brains are not developed, then you're going to start making stupid decisions. Like jumping into a pool without checking the depth, for example, which a boy will do. I was speaking to Gordon Law of Sachs before he left. He was shaking his head one afternoon and he said to me, you're not going to believe this, but you found a whole lot of boarders bunked out last night. And they were standing, and all of you know the swimming pool at Sachs. They were going onto the roof of the swimming pool and jumping over the balcony into the pool. Yo. <laughs> the boys do that. Why? Because the, two, the cognitive side just wasn't operating. You just say, yo, let's go. And so in thing, and then do things without thinking. Do things without thinking. And so we, we complain about them. And so I'm saying, no, you must grow up, you must mature. Whatever other expressions we use in class and to our own sons. But they can't because the two sides of the brain are not connected. And so now, the research is showing, and they've done more research in the last five years on the brain uh, than the rest of human history. And they can now go into certain parts of the brain and see what lights that brain up. And what causes these telephone wires to grow faster? What causes them to say that you're actually now mature? And, uh, and the answer is, we have to get Start thinking about your own sons. But if you want those telephone wires to develop, you have to do, they have to read, because reading causes them to grow. They have to have new experiences. They have to have opportunities to walk up the mountain, to go traveling. They have to have ability to, they have to have opportunities to speak in front of people, debating societies at school, for example, in class, for example. 
but uh, and just <coughs> opportunities that schools like this give people all the time. And so, and with that, then the, the telephone wire starts developing. What retards it? They're now finding out that the, there's a definite retardation, is such a word, of the telephone wires. If uh, boys consume too much alcohol, it doesn't seem to be the case with girls quite as much out of interest. But alcohol, drug abuse, at teenage years, <coughs> it starts to pass as those brain developing. And often, if they abuse that, and they go and binge drinking uh, in the teenage years, you'll find that those telephone wires will stop altogether, and you'll start getting yourself a 40-year-old males who do stupid things like whack people with hockey sticks because they hooted behind them in a car, uh, or the tragic instances that you saw yesterday, <coughs> Um, possible tourists, we need just, we saw what don't know what happened, but we're going to presume we lost his temper and didn't think that we two sides of the brain were getting there. Catherine, do you want to add anything? <laughs> right, the next thing, uh, back to um, Harry Potter again. Uh, I'll tell you why I put that particular picture in. But the first thing that the boys are under threat. There are a few role models and mentors as maybe there were before. I think television and uh, the newspapers revealing what people get up to is probably uh, a case in point. But let's have a look at who the role models were when I was growing up. Role models were priests. Role models were teachers. Uh, role models definitely headmasters. And especially for a boy, role models are sportsmen. And look what's been happening now in the last 10, 15 years of what's been exposed. I take the American president. I mean, uh, when I was at school, Kennedy was uh, president, and he was something we all look up to. Best American president, they say, these days. Uh, so we had people like him we looked up to. But, and, and, the, and the, my era of cricketers, for example, the grand products of this world, I mean, we just idolized these people. We went to New Orleans and we just were, you know, these people were gods. Now what has happened subsequent to them, many of our cricketers were found to have Peter play. Uh, they've been found doing all sorts of things. The press exposes them. The press has exposed the American president like Clinton. Uh, the press is exposing priests. You hear headmasters with fingers in the tool. You hear teachers getting up to all sorts of things. And why was they human? They do it. It's not that they weren't doing it before. Kennedy certainly, as we found out subsequently, was known for a saint. But uh, we just didn't seem to know about it. So, we looked, so the role models uh, were, were, were that much better role models than they are today. So the male role models are actually disappearing out of society. And if you have a look at the uh, English soccer uh, players, those type of role models, you're uh, So the boys today are growing up confused. They've got no one to look up to. And that is a huge cause for concern. <coughs> That's why the role that teachers play, that's why the role that fathers play, are so important in the adolescent boy. The next thing is absent fathers. Now, I was thinking when I was doing all this, what our percentage of black boys at school who don't have a father living at home, and I reckon it's as high as 90 percent. So that's so now our poor black boys at schools like this are coming in and they not having proper role models in their home even, let alone in society. And who are the Role models today in South Africa for a black boy. Is it going to be Zoomers? Is it going to be Lemma? Who's going to be? That's why people like Nati are so important. And it's how unfortunate it was when Nati had that charge against him. Uh, so they're actually fathers. And it doesn't only have to be black families, it can be uh, yeah, our own uh, society. Uh, our fathers who are working too hard, coming home too <coughs> late. And by absent, I mean are absent not only time wise. But are absent uh, from talking to themselves, are absent in putting in emotional time. So that is a, I think those two are a huge cause of concern why our boys are under threat. Interesting that in what way do I mean that they're under threat? Well, uh, if you take the university uh, overseas at the moment, in America I'm told that they're putting affirmative action through the mouths that they, they are insisting now that 40% of their intake has to be male. Because they can't get it up to 40%. Which in Scandinavia now it's up to 75% uh, uh, of the university intake is female. So, males are losing out. 
And I think schools like this are absolutely imperative in making sure that our boys stand up for themselves and have a role to play in society. So, boys are absent fathers. Schools are structured for girls. Uh, um, Catherine has done some reading of that, so you are coming now, Catherine, on this one. Um, and uh, the, she's done some research now on, on the boy's brain <coughs> and the boy at rest and how we act, the male brain at rest, and to how we react to it as teachers. Catherine. Right, the second uh, point uh, there is uh, on my 
headings, gone through the first heading. Uh, and my first thing, just to sum it up and remind you, is, the, <coughs> is that we've got to give our voice opportunities. That's the, the big ball there. Right, my second heading now is the power gap. Now, when I was growing up in the 60s, uh, <laughs> university in the 70s, uh, it was all about power. We all had to go to do military service. There was no, I mean, if I just think back to myself, with in some embarrassment too, is that we never actually even created the system. That was it. You all just listened, you all just did what you told, you all went off to military service, and you all, we, we just heard the lie. We just didn't give it a thought. Uh, and if you did, well, you had that, that man wagging a finger at you, and uh, for those of you who are young, you know, it did go in 1988, so uh, maybe I'm expecting too much to expect everyone to know who it is. Uh, but the power game started from the top. The whole country is run by power. The whole world is run by power. It was not lost on us in schools, and so schools were run the same way. And anyone who stepped out of line, it was the easiest thing to do, and teaching was probably what was very easy in those days. <laughs> Anyone who queried anything, anyone who did anything, uh, you just started their school policy, you just gave them a whack, and then everything was sorted out. And it was sorted out because you just knew no better. And I, and I would say that what caused us at our school to be thinking differently was this. It was once the cane was done away, now suddenly your weaker teachers were really shown up, which you couldn't just send someone from hiding. And now we had to really think, think things differently. Of course, the power game was went even further than that. And I imagine I met Harry Potter again. I want to show you why I had that wand up there. Yeah. And, and in the previous slides, let me go back to quick, was, was chosen in to be that one. Uh, Harry Potter, if you were worried. But uh, uh, the boys now being under threat are actually now wishing that they could be something better. They're wishing that they, their lives would change. And we've got to actually give them the opportunity. So that picture of some of everything I'm talking about. I think I put it in, I had to go back to it. Right, now back to Harry Potter, my last picture of Harry Potter. Uh, I've been faced with three faces like that. Uh, schools were scary places in the 1960s, 70s. There was a hell of a lot of bullying. That whole power game continued. That whole hierarchy continued. The whole hierarchy of the little tricks uh, running the school, uh, but not in a positive way, in a negative uh, way, and everyone else living in fear. Everything was about power. Everything was about privilege. And now, when you do away with this, now, how do you run your school? I mean, that caused us a lot of thinking as to how we are going to do it. And so, after many discussions on ourselves and many seminars like this, uh, we came up with a saying that if every boy needs to belong, or every boy feels that he belongs, because everyone does need to belong, and especially a boy needs to belong, but if they feel that they belong, then we're going to have less trouble on our hands and the less need to use power, in this case, the state. So everything that we've done in the last 10 years has been trying to encourage boys to feel that they belong. And then if they feel that they've got a say in the running of the school, a say in what things happen, uh, then we've got a good school. So the power game went right from the wagging finger to the cane down to the boys at the school and <coughs> schools were a scary place in the 60s, those of us who were there. Know that. Right, so the game is now changing. Three of my head. Got through the power game, and, we, and that, as you all instantly recognize, is John Dunn, the 16th century poet. <laughs> and he wrote, I mean, from Washington's department, would recognize that. And he wrote, No man is an island entire of itself, every man is a piece of continent. Now, thinking, what does that got to do with the school? But that is a significant mind shift if you can get your boys to think that. That no man is an island in three plots, three bigs. Every man is a piece of a continent. You're all part of a whole. If you go to Shakespeare, uh, in one of his plays, I think it was Coriolanus, uh, said something about there's no part of the body that is more important than any other part of the body because if one is injured, then the rest all feel that injury. And if you get the tricks to realize that, then you're on you're on the right track. That you will be a stronger school if all your if you take your grade eight uh, opinions into account, if you bring your 
radiates into the whole scenario and supports you and part of it, uh, we all got one body. Now, I'm telling you that 10 years ago, I scored in that. We were definitely, we were hierarchy. And I think we've now broken that down. So a little bit of in our boarding house, we're struggling there a little bit still, but it's not a, a huge force of concern. We're winning that battle. Then Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, said it very well. The same thing he just said, uh, and that leads into this last point of mine, where he said, leadership and learning are indispensable to one another. Now, take that comment, take John Dunn, and put the two together, and if we're wanting to give them opportunities to learn, what are you wanting them to learn? You want them to learn about themselves, you want them to learn about relationships, because in that way they can all become part of one body, and, they, and that body can become stronger. And our and leadership and learning are indispensable to one another. Right, then about four years ago, this book came out, The World is Flat. And, uh, I've got a copy of it, but it's really good. It's, uh, it's basically about uh, because of computers. Well, it all started because the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall came down, uh, which flattened the world. Uh, suddenly, you could see places that you couldn't see before. Ten years ago, twenty years ago, again when we were growing up, it was very much a case of we we're all in our own little enclaves. We all kept our knowledge to ourselves in our schools, in our classrooms. Uh, in our subject departments. I was told by one person I once worked for, uh, if you have an idea, keep it to yourself, so that when you run your own school one day, you can use it. Now that was the, uh, that was the thinking in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, with the result that people just go over the edge, because the world is not flat, it's round, so you will go over the edge, and that's the picture in the front of um, another edition of the book, the one that, that one, Going over the edge. So, well, again, you know, if you're a sports coach and you learn new techniques from someone or new ideas from someone, keep it to yourself. Uh, if you've got ideas into your school, keep it to yourself. But now the world is flat. Berlin Wall, wall coming down, computers, iPads, iPhones. We could, uh, you can now, I believe, if you want to get your tax returns done, you can send it off at 6 o'clock at night and have it ready by the next day, but it goes off to China to do and the, the, the communication uh, is nice. And so we can now see what others are doing. Again, those of us who grew up in the 1960s, I had not the faintest idea of what was happening in the township. I lived my own life, I grew up next to Sandown Road, I went to school, uh, I played a sport, I came home, and I knew nothing about what was happening in the society. TV has changed that. Communications have changed that, but we can now see how other people are living, and we now have absolutely no excuse. But with the world being flat, we can see what others are doing, and and we can learn from their ideas, and we can make ourselves better. If we make ourselves better, then others see what we're doing, and I think everybody just improves. And uh, that's why I'm actually thrilled to be able to share what little I know, um, because if people can pick up ideas from this, then Ronawash becomes stronger. We have a little peek out of the fence and we see what Ronawash means. We become stronger. And then everyone just improves, just put up standards. So now there's no point in people just keeping ourselves, uh, ideas to ourselves. So I think coaches go and coach in Australia, English coaches come and coach us. And so we just have uh, Michael Ronawash boys go and coach in India. And so we just, and, we, and the ideas just go around and everyone becomes stronger. The whole body becomes stronger. The whole continent becomes stronger to go back to their previous image and then we all benefit. And so that's the, the big change in, in our thinking now. So that has now just given you the, the overview of, of where I'm coming from from a philosophical point of view. Now, how are we going to, um, what are we going to do now? Again, I'm acutely aware that you're probably doing half these things already. I really don't know what you're doing. Uh, but this is what we are doing to try and give opportunities to our boys uh, to break down hierarchy and also to bring out the best of them, the champion of them. Right, so 10 years ago we changed our prefix system completely. Now I have no idea what to do, so you're probably doing something similar. <coughs> but we, the idea of just appointing 12 or 14 boys that you think have got prefix ability, uh, leadership ability, and then just go and make them prefix, and they swan around in the prefix common, braiding and making toasted sandwiches. 
that you just need to touch on. And so now the prefix, and we do uh, uh, realize that there are different types of voids you can have meaning. You can have quite a void meaning. So we've got a completely, I think, different type of void current prefix in the dead area. And so we've got prefix portfolios. Uh, those portfolios are the pillars of the school. Uh, <coughs> academic, sport, culture, and service. Service is a big activity. Now, service is a big activity for a number of reasons. But as soon as a boy realizes that he's not on this planet just to exist for himself, and that he's here to actually make the planet a better place, and that he'll grow as a person, and he won't understand this, but to get the telephone while it's going, um, you actually have to be fully maturing. So the service portfolio is a big one. Sometimes there's two prefix on it. Uh, they're all around houses, they're around grades. Uh, and we go, obviously, they're on the Board of Governors, which is part of our law, but we've got them on other government body committees, which we want their input. And they all run subcommittees. So if they are prefix of service, they will have a, a subcommittee underneath them which they chair. Now, the growth to learning how to run a subcommittee, uh, where you've got to take, you've got to put down an agenda every week, you've got to have minutes every week, which you've got to be sent to me. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and in those subcommittees, you've got to subdivide. So, well, in that uh, service portfolio, for example, they've got boys who do school service and they're looking after the aspects of where we do service in school and then uh, on their outreach program as well. So, that's a big committee. It's got about 10, 12 boys on it. Then you've got house committees. So, they run the school to the house, they run the service in the house. So, all houses are meant to do service. Um, we, one of the first things I did when I took over Wildwood was to say that this, this situation is crazy. I can't run all the discipline in the school. I can't, uh, which was expected. Boys were always being sent to the headmaster where they got a hiding and they went back. They're, well, I can't handle all that now. No, you don't get mine. You've got to talk to them and do X, Y, Z. It's time consuming. So we, we added three extra houses. We now got eight houses and 100 boys a house. And the house heads are now many headmasters, so they've been trained up too. And they handle all the academics of the house, all the pastoral issues of the house, and all the, um, the discipline of the house. And they are helped by their house prefect. They've got a subcommittee. And on those house subcommittees, they can have whatever portfolios they like, but all of them will have an academic one, they'll have a cultural one. Uh, the cultural one runs the house plays, the house singing, uh, house debating that we have. Uh, and house service. All houses are involved in community service in some way. And the amount you learn from that now, on those subcommittees, I've, at the moment encouraged, it just went, uh, I'll take all the grade eights once a week, and I went, um, this week I'll be doing what committee you're on, what committee you're on, what committee you're on. Uh, not forcing them, but encouraging them to get onto the committees. So those committees can, uh, and they're lots of them. So by the end of the day, you've probably got 160 to 200 boys at least sitting on those committees, meeting once a week, learning how to take minutes, Learning how to take responsibility, it was put down that you were going to update the web page on the upcoming school play. And his name goes in the actual column, and the repeat in charge has got to insist that that responsibility to go down. They learn a tremendous amount of uh, By the way, the prefix um, numbers are fluid. I've been under 50 prefix, at the moment you've got 18. Uh, as they do well on their subcommittees and they run the area of their subcommittee well, they can get promoted. So it's a Rather like a busy crew, you know, if you do well, you get promoted up in the second semester. Uh, we're trying this one more and more. The, your talk tomorrow from Gamble Fair is about taking risks, daring to take <coughs> risks. We take huge risks with our boys, I think, uh, in helping them organize events. For example, we've got uh, the gala on Tuesday night. Now, we've got a boy doing the announcing, we've got a boy doing the starting, we've got a new record set <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we'll take that risk. And uh, we have boys speaking at all sorts of functions. Uh, and uh, uh, open days, they speak at the uh, prize giving. We had six, seven boys speaking at the prize giving two weeks ago. Uh, just again, the same thing about telephone wise. Everything's geared to this thing of telephone wise, uh, giving boys opportunity to go into the world. Uh, leading discussions in class, I'm going to come to that later. Uh, our theme for our staff two years ago was we haven't taught all they've learned. Now, how do we know that they've learned? And um, if the teacher is just talking over and over again, they say, the experts say, that if, like I'm doing now, just talking, 
Uh, that only 5% of what I'm saying is going here. Hopefully I'm saying a bit just here, but it's pretty simple. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but if you only talk for however long your period is, and we, we've got Bob in our periods, because we, we do the soundbite system. You teach Bob and I, you've got to be concentrating, you get in there, wham, bam, to the next one. Uh, if it's a second grade 10, then we combine our two half our periods into an hour period, and it works. So the older boys have an hour period, the younger boys have soundbites. And, um, and uh, if you're going to talk for that half an hour, or definitely for that hour, only 5% is going to go in. So if it's an hour period, that's 5% now, that's a general average, 5% difference. Four, three, three. Um, so you've got to be concentrated on that hour period. Right, boys, this has been a fine bit. You know, yeah, they're only taking in, in three minutes worth. If, uh, if, they, if you've got something you can look at as well, I think it goes up to 20. So if you use the eyes and the ears, it does go up. But the statistics are saying that if you get a boy to actually teach his neighbor uh, or to do a discussion in class uh, or to research a discussion, it goes up to 80 85% of it gets retained. Full boy, they do. Uh, I think probably a little lot of schools have this, but it's hugely successful. This one. Now, the, but I want to tell you the, the philosophy behind it that you don't have to be a prefect, you don't have to be a captain of the team, you don't have to be on a subcommittee. But everybody, every matric of one is responsible for another boy. And they grad it. And we call it the value system. And it really, really works well. We do a walk up the mountain at the beginning of the year, the grade eights, their values go up with them. Uh, their values are responsible not only for making sure that they get to the school safely and our uh, tiers, uh, they're also responsible for the whole way through the year. And there's some quite incredible uh, friendships get built up this way. The advantage of the value system. Uh, is that this? I hesitate when I say this because now what happens to somebody at the airline tomorrow, but there's virtually no bullying from senior boys and junior boys because they've been working together over the period of the year. And, uh, and they sit in tutor groups in the morning. Each house group has uh, four tutor groups and they have five matrics in it five elevens, tens, nines, eights, and they meet for a quarter of an hour every 30 minutes every morning. And they talk on mutual issues. You get uh, grade eights leading discussions. That one, I was reading. Uh, so you get a very needing the discussions there. Uh, but because the boys sit together for 20 minutes every day on a Tuesday, they've got a 20 minute period and they've got a half hour period uh, where they have. For example, the man asked the school to discuss this whole thing of uh, the, the rape issue for dogs. So the students are there all discuss that, uh, what we should be doing as a country. I've also asked them in the, sometime in their morning period to discuss whether we get to take the tables and chairs out of, the, out of our tuck shop, out, out of our cafeteria, because they're leaving a mess there. Should we rather just take it out? So we get all of them to discuss it in their value groups. And um, it, it works. That's it. And, but the real reason for it is that when, you know, if, if you take a baby when it's born, all it thinks of it is itself. And it just thinks of food and warmth and that's what it wants. So, and when it doesn't get it, it cries. So it's totally self-centered around itself. Then you move up to the age of two or three, and when you want the sweets in the, in the supermarket, and your mother doesn't put it in the car, then you sit there and you bang your fists on the ground uh, and see what the reaction of your mother is, and you react from that. And so you move on from total concern for yourself till you get to about 14, when you get your second big dose of testosterone as a male, and then you become more self-centered again. It's all about yourself, and it's all about, am I getting the biceps, am I getting the six-pack, am I putting in the cheeks, am I going to have a beard, uh, am I going to be able to shave, and those things become very self-centered, and, it's, uh, and that's the age we've got to be. So in this middle of this whole self-centered, am I going to find a girlfriend age group, now we've got to take them, and by making them aware that they are not the center of the universe, we're actually forcing this telephone wires to, uh, to grow. And so the, and, uh, and that's what our value system is all about. Realize that you're not the most important person in the universe, that you now have someone else to look after. They were trying to get Baltimore Prison, not that I'm comparing one with what's like a Baltimore Prison, but they, um, you know, they've got uh, prisons there tending gardens, they're looking after pets. Uh, realizing that there are people who are worse off than they are, or more weaker than they are, and who depend on them. And I think that's, that's it's a system that has worked well for us boys into the media, the first aid crew, really making them, and so many other, I mean, it doesn't, uh, but uh, I just put that in as an example, just to show that there's so many areas where people can show leadership, 
and you can draw the best out of them. They don't have to be necessarily be a captain, they don't have to be a big deal. Uh, and, and of course, course we need colours for all of them. So they are recognised just as much, uh, and you can get the, we, we call the colours boost on it. And you can get that for first aid, you can get it for first aid rugby, it's the same gold badge, you just as, uh, also come on stage, you'll get your hand shaken, you just as uh, at the beginning of this year, we, we had the equipment that you have now. We are two days away and uh, talking about where we are going to go this year. And so I'm just going to pass on to you what we said. Uh, we were talking about how we're going to improve our teaching in the classroom and we're going to improve the technology by and large. But I started the conference off and I, I said, you know, we took a decision some years ago that we were going to go away from the power game and we were going to, we were going to go. Uh, to getting the, to making boys feel that they belong. That's the route we're going to go. And we put a tagline on our website, which was, we believe in boys. And I said, now we've had that tagline for a while. Do we really believe in boys? Are we really giving them options? You can't believe in boys and then just uh, do all the work yourself. Organize the garden yourself, which is just more convenient that way. So do we really believe in boys? So what are we doing or going to do this? to show that we're going to trust our voice and we're going to take risks. And so I just thought that, that everyone had to fill in a slip of paper to show what they were going to do and in their classes, in their sports team, in their extramural activity. So I'm just passing on to you what we as a school have decided that we're going to do this year. <coughs> right. There was a quite a lot of discussion on this one, but we were going to try and encourage more discussions in class. It's difficult for the half hour period when you're just doing a sound bite. Uh, but we're going to have more pair discussions. There are some folk who are saying there's no point in having discussions in threes because you always have one voice sitting out. So we are going to do just little things in our classroom like, oh, won't you discuss X now? Well, what do you think of this that we're just doing? And for 20 seconds have a discussion just to get more people talking and everyone involved. Uh, we're going to give more voice opportunities to research discussions and to, and to share discussions in the classroom. We are going to give boys, uh, if they clearly understood the math they were uh, doing, we are going to delegate boys to help the weak ones in the class. And we are also going to encourage and see if we can get boys in senior grades, not from tricks, but in grade 11, 10, to go down and help other grades. And because if you te teach something, then you obviously understand it. And it just helps people grade problems. So that's what we're going to do. And Julian Taylor, there when he always is, uh, we haven't discussed the fact as a staff yet, because this is all what they said they were going to try and do on these slips, and we're going to have a staff meeting this week when I'm going to go through all this. Uh, on their slips, they said they're going to give more opportunities to present topics, to run tracks, and then extra murally. Uh, this is going to be quite interesting to do. Uh, we're going to be asking more boys to prepare uh, and run skills of practice. Obviously, under supervision and discussion beforehand, we're going to rotate captaincy in lower teams. Uh, we're going to give far more duties and practices. It's obviously easier for the coaches to I'll check with the rope around the field is fine, <coughs> the sun's out, or fish off the ball. Uh, but we're going to be doing that, just minor things, but we sort of like a spiral. You've got to start there, and then you just get bigger and bigger as they get higher up the school. Uh, we're going to get far more boys, we have, I think we're quite good at that at the moment actually, uh, but far more boys into, uh, into those positions, actually managing our hiring prepping. And then, none of those, I'm sure, will try this, but now we're specifically are gearing ourselves this year to, to be doing that. And now you understand the reason why, from a brain point of view, why we're doing it. So, there we have it. I've reached the end of my four points, but I just thought I'd finish up on these. John Betjeman, a poet, who said, Our job is not to put leadership into boys, but it's just to bring it out. So if I started with that slide, that is really everything I've just said today. So everything we're doing in schools, all those small things that you do, all the little delegation that you do, is actually with us, actually helping to bring leadership out in boys. And it's nothing new in this, I'm sure it's been done for years, but we're now going to do more and more, because if we don't do that, we go to our fire game. And then Joe Montana <coughs> was uh, a famous quarterback, uh, quarterback in 1949, for, uh, sorry, the San Francisco 49ers, and there's a picture of him on the right hand side. 
and uh, a player who played with him was asked what it was like to play with Joe Montana. And his reply has gone down, in my opinion, as the finest quote on leadership for boys that I've read anywhere. And here it is. What did the players say when asked what it was like to play with Joe Montana? He said, you know, when Joe was on the team, I played better. I can't tell you often I tell this quote to the boys. If you want to know whether you're a good prefect or not, if you want to know whether you do a good job as a teacher, uh, are the boys better because you were there? Are they playing better because you were captain? Is your house committee working better because you were there? That is a fine quote on the issue. Because that's what it's all about. It's just getting people to feel better about themselves, getting them to get involved, uh, and then their whole standard of whatever they do, be it cricket or maths or running a committee or being involved just in pieces. And that really is what I love. Okay. And boys understand that question. So you can have all the questions you like on leadership, and they're all great, but uh, to me, that, that's what boys understand. And then finally, uh, well, that's been the, the, <coughs> the, the slide of what I'm trying to say. There we are, helping boys along, bringing out the best in them. But I just want to finish up with a, a story about an American Indian tribe, which for those of you parents here, uh, and certainly for those of us teachers, you will understand exactly what I'm not saying. The, there is a tribe in America that says when a boy reaches the age of 15, uh, that he has a he must have a learning experience, and he gets taken by his father up the mountain, and he gets left on the mountain overnight, and the father leaves him, uh, and says, and his last instructions were to him were, uh, oh, uh, you don't move until you see the sun come up. So this boy takes his peanut butter sandwich or whatever his mother's back for him that night and takes him up the mountain and leaves him there. And now we can all imagine what he goes through. You know, it's dark, uh, there's a rustle in the trees, the shadows, some noise from over there, and of course he doesn't sleep or wink the entire night. And he keeps on sort of saying, is that the dawn? Is that light coming? But no, it's not. And you can imagine the angst that he goes through the entire night. On his own, up the mountain with all the fire, lions and tigers and everything else that you mentioned so I arrived. And then finally the dawn arrives. And with great relief, he gets up and he says, right, let's get over and out of this one. And as he leaves to go down the mountain, he sees a movement from behind the tree. And says, Dad, he'd been behind the tree watching him all night. And that's actually our job as males, uh, fathers and teachers, is to actually be behind the tree and just watch you go. So we give these boys opportunities to make mistakes. We give these boys, we imagine that you are running the Gala on Tuesday night, but we actually there behind the tree. We there sort of picking up any mistake that they might have and keeping the odd lion and tiger at bay. And that's our job in bringing up our boys and bringing the best out of them. Because it's awesome.